And the idea is that by having a musical body, we build musicianship that can then transfer to instrumental playing or to vocal or choral singing. I love it because it invites me to be there as a whole person and as a musician who both has a heart and has a mind and has a body and to invite all the parts of me to become musical. Hello, welcome to the Flute 360 podcast, where we incorporate a panoramic view of flute-related topics. I am your host, Heidi K. Begay, and this is episode 88, Del Crow's Eurythmics and Integrative Education with Veronica Bilfiski. Today's sponsor is brought to you by J&K Productions. Did you know that not only are they a production company for podcasts, but they are a recording company for musicians? Any musical recording needs that you may have, J&K Productions can fulfill that need. They have all the necessary equipment and expertise to record your next flute recording for college or graduate auditions, competitions, summer festivals, or a flute album. J&K Productions can record any setup imaginable, from solo flute, small chamber, flute and piano, and much more. Consider J&K Productions for your next recording project. Contact them at jkproductions.media. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another Flute 360 podcast episode. Today, my special guest is Veronica Bilfiski. She is a flutist and an educator who incorporates Delcro's techniques within her lessons. Today, we talk about how we as musicians can internalize movement within our bodies in order to show our musical intentions through our instrument. Hello, Veronica. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure. So for those who may not know you, can you please share a little bit about who you are and your background? Uh, sure. So I am a flutist and a music teacher, and as I've done work both on the performing side and on the teaching side, I've also become involved in organizing and, and creating projects and being more on the administrative side, mostly because I wanted my own little projects to capture my values and to express those values. And then as I've gotten involved with larger organizations, I just realized that like I want to contribute to making them better and to better matching the way I would like to see the music and education world work. And so for about the past year, I've also been doing some development work for Integral Steps. Oh, neat. Yeah, I came across your name actually through Emma. And we were talking at NFA and she said, we need to put together a Flute 360 series about flute and movement. And I must have Veronica on the show, a part of the <laughs> series. <laughs> And well, so, thank you. Oh, yeah. And so when I looked up your website, um, you attributed Emma as being one of your teachers. And I'm like, oh, there is the connection with the Del Crows and with her being a co-founder of Integral Steps and seeing that you're a part of it. I thought that was really neat to see that connection. Absolutely. And I think in the music world, we thrive on relationships and, you know, it's never just a business transaction of like creating a product. It's always about like the context that you do it in. And, and it, it's been really nice to kind of collaborate with Emma in so many different levels too. Mm. Yeah. Beautifully said. It is definitely all about the relationships. Cool. So today's topic is Del Crow's Eurythmics and Integrative Education. So before we get into all the nitty gritty and how you got into Del Crow's, can you please share with the listeners what the Del Crow's methodology is? Sure. So Delcro's education, you might have also heard it called Delcro's Eurythmics, is a way of learning music using movement. And so you connect music to your own body and to movement. You uh, have very social and interactive ensemble experiences in class away from the instrument to really experience the music. And then 
draw out and discover the theoretical aspects of music. And the idea is that by having a musical body, we build musicianship that can then transfer to instrumental playing or to vocal or choral singing. And I love it because it invites me to be there as a whole person and as a musician who both has a heart and has a mind and has a body and to invite all the parts of me to become musical uh, and to deepen my musicianship so that when I pick up my instrument to play, I feel like I'm more connected to myself and to what I want to say. Oh, I love it. I am having goosebumps over here because I kid you not, I had a private conversation with my husband about a week ago and I took a lesson with a Greek flutist here and I realized that, well, I mean, obviously, we all know that people are built, like you just said, mind, body, spirit. You know, we have these aspects. Right. And I told Eric, I said, oh, my gosh, I am playing too much with my mind. I'm a thinker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I think too much. And I said, I think that's what my flute instructor wanted me. And she was trying to grab and pull out of, you know, my musicianship, <laughs> the spirit and the body. Right. And I was like, oh, ding, ding, ding. And light bulbs went off. And just hearing you just say just now to utilize the mind, body and spirit, I feel so validated. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah. And I, and I think also like our culture very much prioritizes the mind and it's all about like, you know, even in the flute world, like, have you thought about how you use your air? Are you doing this? Are you, you know, have you thought about what your phrasing is, but have we actually felt the phrase or have we let, you know, this flute concerto that we've all heard so many times, have we let that truly touch us and, and express some emotion that maybe we need to express today, not the emotion that, you know, we had 10 years ago when we played it in a masterclass, but today, how is this music making us feel and how are we expressing that today? Mm, I love it. And today, because music is in the present, I mean, when yeah. you play it and when you're blowing air into your flutes and expressing yourself in any way you wish, I mean, yeah. it is currently in the present moment. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And I think we we forget that in, you know, like... Yes, we need to play more new music. And yes, sometimes getting stuck in the classical mu music canon gets a bad rap because, you know, we're like, okay, we've all heard this symphony so many times. But as a balance, a counterbalancing argument, maybe, you know, it's what you said, that music is in the present and it becomes real and live to us as we experience it today in this moment, as we make it together and as we listen to it together. Hmm. Do you think we forget that it's in the present because it was, say it's a Baroque piece written by J.S. Bach, and we're like, oh, sure. that was written in the 17th century. So do we maybe forget that the music that we're playing right now is happening in the moment because the composer is long gone? And, oh, what did they do back then? I don't know. Like, I'm just oh, kind of yeah. going off on a little tangent. <laughs> sure. Yeah, it's an interesting question. You know, I think the narrative that we use in the classical music world, yeah, often forgets that. Hmm. And and so I think if you if you are going to choose to remember that yes, it's in the present, I haven't heard as many people talk about that as they have about how this music is old and therefore either it's irrelevant or therefore how do we make it relevant? And as you're saying, the answer might be right before our eyes. It's in the present. So it is relevant to us right now because we are in the <laughs> present. But I, I think it might be also interesting. Maybe this is another idea for your podcast to talk to some people in the historical performance movement about how they feel about that, because they might, you know, have more insights about that question as well. Yeah, no, I love it. Series 20. <laughs> it's That's already, right. yeah. <laughs> it's in the works as we speak. Oh, awesome. shoot. So how do you integrate your Adele Crow's knowledge into your private flute lessons with your students? Lately, I have been very aware of how my students are in their bodies and how, um, kind of the the psychological state that they bring with them to flute playing really affects their sound. 
when I work with eighth graders or ninth graders, they're in this phase of life where they they really care about what other people think of them and and it really affects them. And sometimes it, it kind of causes them to retreat and shrink in their bodies. And so I've been working a lot with my students on, you know, taking up the space that your body takes up and, and not being just accepting that. I guess another thing that I think Dalco's Eurythmics does incredibly well is give us a rhythmic experience rather than a mathematical understanding of duration relationships. We have an experience of them first. So we can experience how a quarter note has a walking or a marching quality to it. And we can experience how a half note has a longer, slower, kind of stretchier duration. And to experience those relationships through movement first, even if in the private lesson, we don't actually have enough space to walk and march and and drag our toes and make super long gestures for the slows. um, We can still do that maybe using our arms and our hands and, and to experience the duration through your body first. And then to say, now let's use our mind to analyze, okay, how many counts was the red, the, the marching note? How many counts was that slow note? And, and then you look at the abstract symbol and you're, and it, and it becomes real to you rather than just some numbers on the page. Mm. Yeah. I love it. So they're actually integrating those rhythms deep within rather than it being a mind thing. Yeah. And yesterday I had a chance to introduce to a nine-year-old student this idea of the marching and the slow. And first I showed him how he could play marching notes on the piano. He was just improvising and playing on the black keys. And then, uh, cause I also teach beginning piano and then, uh, and then he got to play some long, slow notes and I showed him how I would move to that. And then I said, okay, now you do it. And so he went around the room and, and did that and was really into it. And then I said, well, did you know that this piece of music has marching notes and slow notes in it. And his face just lit up. He's like, really? Like, like this thing that I just got to do that was really fun, like is on the page. Now I get to play them and understand what they are. And so that was a really beautiful moment for me to be like, wow, like when we really involve our whole selves in this rhythmic experience, then we're excited to discover it in the music that we've been assigned. So cool. So you've dabbled with this question already in your answers, but just to kind of really bring it full circle for the listeners, how have you seen it impact their musical growth? Thank you for the question. (laughs) It's, I think we, we often experience things so much and it's actually really nice to have this opportunity to articulate very succinctly my answer. When we put music in our bodies And when we engage our emotions, when we have experiences with other people that are ensemble based, I think we have an understanding of music that is really deep, that that touches us in many ways. And that means that when we go to an instrument, we are playing from all of ourselves rather than just from the fingers or just from our intellectual understanding of what we need to do with the technique. I think we're playing from our hearts. I think we're playing from the kinesthetic memories that we have that the movement gave us because If you have moved at a steady beat and if you have moved those durations, then when you sit down at the piano or when you pick up your flute, you are going to have a memory of that experience that is kinesthetic and and physical rather than just intellectual. And that is such a strong base to play from. Hmm. I love it. So I feel like the more I move and integrate these rhythms and you know, the black and white on the page is not black and white. It's just a representation of the sound. Right. So the more right. I'm getting into the sound, the more I've realized by utilizing my body in this way, I blow more air. I just do. <laughs> I don't know if that's wow. something you've noticed. And therefore, the tone is better. I'm filling up the room. The resonance and the projection is better. It's just yeah. more alive. So I don't know if you've seen that correlation between, you know, what we've just been discussing and the air flow sure. and management. Well, I'm very curious about your own self-analysis, if we can be a little intellectual and analytical about it. Do you think that 
before you did more movement work, you were not letting your air flow freely. Like it's a sense of, of freedom and release in the air. Mm -hmm. I think so. Mm. I definitely think so. Like if it's an intellect, like before it was an intellectual thing for me. And of course we have to use our minds. We have to count and stuff like that. But if it's all up in the brain, then it almost felt like to me, like, okay, fingers, you better get this right. And so if my focus is like the tongue or the fingers, then I'm really just like what's secondary then, or, you know, the least of my worries is the air, but actually the air needs to, I mean, the air is the foundation. You're not going to, you're not going to tongue or finger anything if the air is not flowing. So, and the air is such a physical thing because the air is in the body, right? So Mm -hmm. if you're using your body and I felt like, okay, I have to like, show this in my music and what would my body do? How would my body move? The air just naturally mm-hmm. spilled out from wow. me. What a, that's so beautiful. Yeah. I love that you said it spills out. Yeah. yeah I think that's my hope mm. for learning music in this way where it really, you know, it engages all of you so that it's, it's inside you in a very multifaceted way so that when you, just gain a little bit of technique on an instrument, the music spills out and you gain a little bit more technique to do something else that you already have, that you already hear inside you, that you already feel inside you. And it really motivates you to learn a little bit more technique because then you can spill out that music that's already inside you even more effectively. Hmm. I like making these connections together and just having that dialogue. Yeah. And thank you for sharing the story about the air moving freely. I think you know, to answer your question, I do see students and and even I hear myself being able to play more freely, like with more flow. And um, when I talk to my high schoolers about it, I say, don't drop the ball, like don't drop the musical ball, like keep it in the air and don't let it fall. Because when you have a phrase, like you really have to sing all the way through, or you have to connect it all the way through. And, and I think, yeah, I have seen that flowing quality. And now as a result of your story, I'll pay more attention. Is it like, is it the air? Is it the, I mean, it must be the air, but there's also like a sense of you hear in your mind, a whole connected phrase. And so even if you are stopping to breathe in between, or even if you're, you know, if it's a more staccato passage and you're making puffs of air rather than a flowing air stream, I think there's still like a a mental connection that in your mind, you hear a connected phrase and that affects the sound as well. I love it. Well, even just then, I swear, Veronica, you must be my brain (laughs) because (laughs) I kid you not, like you must have like a little camera in this Airbnb or something and going into my brain and seeing what's been going on. Literally like the last two weeks, I'm like, okay, I mean, you know, there's more direction in my phrase. I'm doing a really job getting to like my point or uh, the cadence yeah. or, and I'm, and I'm saying something in the phrase beginning, middle, end. Right. And so I'm like, everything you're saying about caring, don't drop it, don't drop it. Go all the way to the en- end of the phrase has been literally my epiphany these last couple of weeks. Hmm. And this idea of like, you know, how we always hear support the air, you know, I've been toying with using different adjectives, like carry the air, yeah. en- engage with the air, Things like that. And so anyways, you know, in the phrase, and if I know where my cadence is, what am I going to say from beginning, middle to end? And even if I have to take a break with a quick breath, like say, you know, say it's a four bar phrase and say I need to take a quick breath at the comma, say two bars, I'm still carrying that air up and over the breath mark in order to get to my final destination. And so this whole idea, you just said, like, you tell your students, don't drop the ball, don't drop the musical ball. That's literally (laughs) what I've been telling myself in the sense of carry the air, carry the ball, or even the analogy I've been thinking of like a baby, don't drop the baby. And so (laughs) (laughs) um, I don't know. So it's just, it's just, oh, I love when when life gives you these like validations or just like, yep, you're on the right track because it just feels like you're not crazy anymore. Right. Right. (laughs) Well, I'm glad to hear that. Um, You're giving me good ideas about 
exercises I'm going to do next week with my students because the fun part about a Dalcro's class is I have balls, I have students, and I can make them carry that ball all around the room to the music. And and it becomes a really vivid concept uh, that, you know, to make a musical phrase be compelling, you have to carry that ball all the way to the end and mm-hmm. then you pass it off maybe to the next student. And I just want to say one thing about adult students, okay? because I have been thinking about adults and, and teaching some adults recently, too. And and when you hand them a ball, they're like, are you being condescending? Like, are mm-hmm. you treating me like a 10 year old? Because I'm an adult. I really want you to know that I'm a serious person. I am here to seriously learn music. And and you just handed me a toy. <laughs> so <laughs> I think we have to, you know, strike a balance between not creating activities that are going to feel babyish, but also we all learn better when we use our bodies. Hmm. Like, yes, I can tell an adult, you have to carry the phrase all the way through. But I promise that if they actually use their body, if they feel excited about something and engage emotionally in it, they're going to have a stronger learning experience. And Hmm. so, you know, I try to remember for myself, like, okay, now I'm going to practice this passage in my serious flute sonata, but I'm going to uh, trot around the room and then I'm going to do my slow dragging steps all around the room. And someone might walk by and think I'm being a little silly, but I'm having a fabulous rhythmic experience (laughs) and I'm learning it really deeply and I'm going to enjoy that. Mm -hmm. And so to give adults space for that, I think is important. And maybe we just have to contextualize it. Like, I, yes, I'm asking you to do something that might feel a little bit silly, but let me tell you how serious it actually is. <laughs> let me tell you how deep your learning actually is going to be if you do this. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. My friend Sam, he and I started our doctorate and ended our doctorate together. And his DMA thesis was on this Delcros based knowledge and, and using it to, you know, make us uh, freer flutists and yeah um and so a lot of his master classes that he gave at texas tech university uh you had to get in there and experience it for yourself because if you were like an observer and intellectually wanted to sit and just observe the class it literally would not transform you the way it did if you walked it stepped it danced it skipped it i mean you can't you cannot put it into words unless you actually get to experience it absolutely yeah Yeah. i'm curious heidi what you know you've talked about your epiphany what have you been doing that led to that epiphany like what kinds of things have you tried in movement yeah good question so I've been thinking a lot. Well, to be very (laughs) vulnerable here, I'm going to be candid. So we mentioned before the conversation that between me graduating in May of 18 to 19, I did not get the jobs I wanted. And so I'm listening, you know, being very objective and saying, okay, why? You know, like, where can I improve? And I'm like, all right, my research is really good. And my teaching experience is really good. Maybe my recordings could be better. So then I'm listening back to the recordings in a search committee way and saying, okay, yeah, you're playing the right notes. You're playing the right rhythms. That's cool. And then I realized, oh, as as the listener, I am not feeling, experiencing anything. And then I realized, oh, I'm not actually like exaggerating my eyes for them to actually be heard. I mean, inside my Mm -hmm. mind, I think I'm doing it. (laughs) (laughs) And if you ask me, like, I am like sincerely wholeheartedly saying, yes, I'm, I'm showing you, you know, what I mean. And I'm, I'm giving you my stamp of approval on this music, but it actually did not come through. So I had to kind of give uh, you and the listeners that background to understand then for me to break this down. So then I realized, okay, I am approaching this intellectually and I'm not using the spirit or the body. And so I'm like, Mm -hmm. okay, I have to actually put my heart into this as if my life depended on it. I actually have (laughs) to feel this. I mean, and so what I realized was because I'm a thinker, I see life in even though I, I love my family and I, you know, I'm a, I'm a very passionate friend and I, I have certain things that, you know, I wholeheartedly love. Music to me was so black and white. It was either like, yeah. because I am such a visual person, 
the the notation is black and white, right? And right. so I'm doing it, I'm playing it, but I didn't play or I didn't realize that it's just the black and white is the representation of the sound and then listeners want to be taken somewhere. So for right. me, in order for me to get into my body, just going back to like again Sam's presentations at Tech. I mean, I experienced it. I'm like, "Oh, that's nice." But then to actually like incorporate it into what you said earlier, that crazy flute sonata or the I mean, I had to apply it. I mean, you can't just say, oh, yeah, I had that one day where he gave a, an hour, you know, presentation of right. activities. So the things he would do is like use a scarf or use a hula hoop for a hoop vibrato or uh, skipping it and dancing it. Meter was a big thing. I don't want to misquote him, but like just the difference between like a three, four, or two, four, and how does that right. feel different in the body? So a lot right. of it's stepping. A lot of it is just going back to my ballet days. Like how would I yeah. dance that? You know, right. let right. me, let me honor the five-year-old Heidi that's with inside and, <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and, and dance it out because that was my first experience to art was through right. ballet. And so I'm like, if I can feel it in my body through these ballet steps or improvise in some way with some new steps or new positions that I may not be familiar with, that's good. And just, just something to get my musical point across. Yeah. 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 That is so exciting to hear. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. My brain is like lighting up with other questions and things, but I also want to make sure that we, you know, get through the questions you wanted to ask today. <laughs> oh, you're sweet. I feel like the backstory was almost needed for the, like the logical like sure. thinkers out there. You know what I mean? Like to put everything in context. Cool. So let's yeah. talk about today's second topic of integrative education. You are involved with a nonprofit organization, Integral Steps, what is your role within the organization and how has your time with the group impacted you and your career? Uh, sure. So Integral Steps is a nonprofit that was founded by Emma Shubin and her colleague and business partner Alejandra Houdan, who is a clinical psychologist. And what I think is really beautiful about their partnership and their mission uh, in this organization is to bring together Emma's knowledge of music education and Alejandra's knowledge of child development and to think about how are we teaching the whole person. You know, as music teachers, we often come across things that are more in the psychology realm as we teach. And it's it's amazing to have someone with expertise in that field um, as part of the organization in such a important way. And Integral Steps does more than just music education, even though right now it's a big part of our offerings. The hope is really to teach any subject in this integrative way where we consider the whole person and we consider how are we supporting their intellectual growth? How are we supporting their emotional development? How are we supporting their physical development? How are we creating experiences that are balanced between these three areas so that the learning is truly strong? And as you can see, there are many overlaps with Dalco's education. I think what Emma and I both experience so strongly is that Dalcro's education is integrative in this way. Integral Steps also offers classes that are biology and art and music and movement and integrating those subjects through this integrative lens or offering workshops for adults who want to have a flute weekend. So it's called the Integrated Flutist. And they have, you know, master classes and ensemble experiences and group classes, but but it is really through this integrative lens of not only uh, passing on intellectual flute knowledge, but also um, having experiences together that really touch us in all of these different ways. And so my role with Integral Steps is right now to be development director and also to be an instructor for projects and for summer camps. And the organization is based in Colorado in Louisville, which is just outside of Boulder. And I, last year, last school year, had the honor of 
actually moving out to the Boulder area and being an integrative education fellow at Integral Steps it was the first time we this was the first time this program happened. And so I had the chance to actually co-teach with Emma and have a lot of guided teaching experiences in this way. And it it really transformed how I teach and how I think about myself in the world, uh, being aware of maybe these centers of myself and, and how, how am I taking care of myself and how am I taking care of my own development and, and a balanced life with this framework? I think the fact that it touched me as a person and not only touched my teaching really speaks to the fact that the founders of the organization live what they teach and that it touches their staff as much as it touches their students. Um, and to feel like now I have this deeper understanding that I can share not only with my integral steps students when I go and teach summer camps or, or do workshops with them, but also my other teaching jobs. And also when I'm practicing my flute, which is when I'm teaching myself actually, right. Mm -hmm. Uh, to really consider how integrative learning is at the core of who we are. And I think it's just something we've maybe forgotten, it feels like it, it's like a coming home to things we already know hmm. that we are in our bodies and that we have emotions and we have a fabulous mind that loves to think and analyze and all of them are important. And to honor all three makes us feel more alive, makes us have a richer life. Hmm. Oh, beautifully said. I would love to pick your brain more, but I know you are one very busy lady. So I will respect your time and make sure you get off to the next thing. But thank you so much for your time, energy and talents. And we appreciate you helping us along this musical journey. Of course. Thank you. And Heidi, I want to say your podcast for me uh, fills such a hole of dialogue in the music community and and for us sharing and exchanging the experiences that we have, because I think often we get very isolated and we, not because we want to be territorial about our jobs, but just because when you are doing many different projects, you just feel like very scattered and very separate from your musical colleagues. And I appreciate the work that you do in bringing us together and getting people to share what they know and, and engage in these conversations. So thank you for that. Oh, that means a lot to me. Thank you, Veronica. Of course. All right. Have a great day. You too. Do you love seeing children excited about learning music and playing the flute? Kinder flute classes are carefully designed to create a love of learning. During the teacher training classes, flute teachers learn how to integrate games and movement into their classes to both motivate and maximize learning potential. The movement activities and games are foundational to helping the students maintain a keen sense of alertness. Not only does Kinder Flute motivate students, but also the teacher training classes has energized and transformed many studios. The ideas from the teacher training classes can be applied to students from ages four through 12. The next U.S. training class will be this summer, July 8th through the 11th, but it's not too early to sign up. The available spaces are limited, so it's best to sign up as early as possible. They will be held just north of Pittsburgh, and the housing is at the beautiful Eden Hall at Chatham University. Thank you for listening to the Flute 360 podcast. For more information, please visit HeidiKBegay.com. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review in the iTunes store. Let's talk about flute.